five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will itself be 30 seconds. Members who wish to speak in the debate on the amendment should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the amendment. I refer members now to the marshal list. And I call amendment one in the name of Oliver Mundell. Mr Mundell, to move and speak to amendment one, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I speak to the amendment in my name. It is a simple amendment which asks the Scottish Government to report back to this Parliament on resourcing this legislation. Principally, it is designed to act as a backstop to cover a very specific set of circumstances, namely where local authorities do not have insurance or have inadequate insurance cover for the relevant period. This chamber will hear from the Minister that she does not want to write a blank cheque. Perhaps that is so, but I say to members, do not be fooled, because the simple fact is this. If, as the Minister will argue, the true costs and resources needed for this legislation are unknown, unquantifiable, and the Scottish Government can't put a figure on it, then the Minister is asking us to write that very same blank cheque for her. And worse still, she's asking others to guarantee it. Presiding officer, nobody can disagree with the merits of this legislation. Its intentions are virtuous, long overdue and much welcomed. Survivors and victims of childhood abuse have been denied justice for far too long, but they deserve better than a rushed job, a job half done. That's why it's imperative we take this opportunity to get things right. Vile monsters have been allowed to hide behind, no thank you, uh, vile monsters have been allowed to hide behind the law, shielded by technical legal considerations. For years, the state didn't want to know. Many who've held elected office have let these individuals down, and we should not ignore that fact. In my view, we are duty bound to take collective responsibility for the failings of the past. And it's only in taking that, and in taking that responsibility, it's only right that we acknowledge the financial cost which comes with trying to put things right. We cannot, in good faith, put this legislation on the statute books without recognising... Yes? Beg your pardon, wait till I call. Your own Mackay, please. Sorry. The member agree that this uh, amendment would delay access to justice for survivors who have waited far too long? Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for that intervention, but I don't accept that. The only thing which would delay access to justice for survivors is the Scottish Government dragging its heels on committing to properly funding and resourcing this legislation. The report I'm asking... Yes? I beg your pardon, John Finney. Yes. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. I didn't support the proposal at stage two, and I appreciate it's narrower now, and I appreciate the point that he's trying to make. I wonder if the members had discussions with COSLA about that particular point and what their position on it is, please. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the member for that intervention. I've not had direct discussions uh, with COSLA on the specific wording of the amendment, but the briefing that they sent round to parliamentarians ahead of this stage three debate made their concerns very clear. There are a number of local authorities across Scotland who do not have adequate insurance cover uh, for the entire period. And I would welcome an intervention from the minister if she wants to. Yep. Minister. Point. I, I'm just looking at the... Uh, the paper that COSLA sent to uh, the committee, to Justice Committee, in terms of stage three uh, process, and I quote directly, we noted with interest the amendment which was discussed and not eventually adopted, uh, and we recognise that given the uncertainty around numbers, it would be very difficult to agree on a financial figure up front of implementation. Does the member accept uh, that uh, COSLA has uh, stated uh, the, the position that reflects indeed the evidence that the Justice Committee received from a number of witnesses that in advance of implementation of this bill, the potential impact is simply unquantifiable? Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for that intervention, but this is a different amendment uh, from what was discussed at stage two. It's narrower and only looks at the retrospective aspects. And secondly, secondly, if the costs are unquantifiable and we don't know what they are, how can we ask local authorities and other organisations to bear that risk rather than take responsibility as legislators and in the case of the government, responsibility for legislation it has brought forward? 
So I think we can't pass in good faith this legislation without recognising the need to put adequate resources in place. To do so is just not fair and it's not right. By failing to address this issue, we run the very real risk that by passing the legislation, we will be passing the buck. And in passing the buck, we will be passing the burden on to local authorities. Local authorities who are already overstretched and badly under-resourced. In practical terms, it could mean that we're asking councils to further cut services today to pay for the mistakes of, our, of the past. On our watch, here and now, we have a choice. Do we ask the vulnerable individuals who rely on local authority provision to bear the risk that comes with the seemingly unquantifiable? Or do, what, or do we do what is right and have a full and proper scoping exercise to ensure that this legislation is not only enacted, but enacted well. Surely, given the systematic scale of abuse that has occurred, central government must share some of the responsibility and help mitigate the risks. Today, the Scottish Government has a chance to make good. Ministers cannot take credit for these changes, while at the same time failing in their duty to ensure they are properly resourced. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Mundell. I have six members who want to speak, and I'm going to try and get you all in. So could I please have short contributions. I call first Claire Baker, and then I'll take Alec Cole-Hamilton. Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. This is an amendment that has been improved since Stage 2, and it now provides greater clarity and addresses some of the concerns of the committee. The committee agreed at Stage 1 that it was vital that the bill was properly resourced, and the amendment is a response to the ongoing concerns about funding, concerns which the committee heard in evidence. It is vital we reassure survivors that justice and compensation is available. There will be costs to local authorities defending any actions, and the evidence to the committee indicated the patchy nature of insurance provision. The bill is more than just a signal of support. We need to provide certainty that the financial resources are available when cases are brought forward. We must recognise the strength of feeling there is that that confidence is lacking. Um, I do hear what the Minister has said in arguments opposing the amendment at committee. However, there are two things I'd like to say about that. I don't accept that the amendment will delay the bill, and I don't also accept that the report is a request for an agreement on an actual figure. Um, surely the government can provide a report that will give assurances that sufficient financial resources will be available. Otherwise, they're suggesting a situation where they can't guarantee that resources will be available, a situation which could completely undermine the intent of the bill. Um, and the minister also talked about a blank cheque at committee. It is important that the minister um, gives assurances that the government will meet responsibilities and that local authorities are able to meet responsibilities. Otherwise, it's to suggest that the amount is going to be capped and that there will, might be some difficulties in people receiving um, recom recompense. Um, I don't accept that the report is asking for an onerous or an impossible task from the government. I believe that it's possible for the government to produce a report which is appropriate and proportionate and is one that can provide assurances to survivors that this legislation can be meaningful and effective and I do intend to support the amendment. Thank you very much. Alec Cole Hamilton, then I'll take Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to offer the support of these Liberal Democrat benches to Amendment 1 in the name of Oliver Mundell. My colleague Liam MacArthur agreed at Stage 2 that the financial memorandum around this bill was too narrow and did not account for the significant surge in demand for resource that might occur at every level in the immediate aftermath of implementation. And the problem that particularly exists um, where insurance cover for the period in question has expired or never existed. Whilst there were some problems with the Stage 2 Conservative amendment, the principle at its heart was sound. And whilst it fell, the Scottish Government could have then brought forward its own amendment to answer the challenge identified therein. This they failed to do. Members have been well briefed by Solar, Social Work Scotland and COSLA that such a gap in resourcing in this area could pose an existential risk to the process. So whilst the Scottish Government attests that this amendment might delay the implementation of the Act, I would suggest that the possibility that this process may in some cases grind to a halt for want of resource rep represents a far more significant impediment to justice for those victims of historic abuse and we shall support the amendment accordingly. Uh, thank you. After Stuart Stevenson, I call Joanne Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think it's fair to say that the amendment that's now before us is more narrow in its scope and is closer to what we could take forward than the one that came forward in committee uh, from a former colleague uh, of Oliver Mundell. 
but it still suffers from the same basic problems. It now means the bill can move forward, but if implemented, it would be a potential roadblock to the laying of the regulations that would give effect to the bill. Now, why is that so? Um, I accept it's public bodies only. By the way, that's not simply local authorities, we should bear in mind. Uh, but, but the real, real thing is the words in the fourth line of the amendment that says, meet any obligations arising from an action brought. Now, let's examine an example of, I will develop my point if I may, Mr. Mundell, first. Um, th 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 there is no limit of time associated with that because it's any obligation arising from the action. Somebody at the age of 100 years old, long after I, despite my ambitions to live forever, have shuffled off this mortal coil, could bring forward and succeed with um, a, a court action that results in a payment being made. The normal process by which we would deal with an obligation that might arise in 2070, 2080, 2090 even, would be through the normal budget process of this parliament. It is quite unreasonable that we work out by some random uncalibrated wet finger estimate what the costs are going to be in 60, 70 years' time. We simply can't do that. And I defy anybody in the chamber to give a methodology by which we can do that. The provision of the court services and the compensation from public bodies that go with this particular amendment are matters that have to be dealt with closer to the point of application. If we accept this in this environment, why don't we say we have to fund the court services and all future obligations of all public bodies from now until forever? The principle would take you to that point. I'm not objecting to, of course, proper funding. I'm actually can, can you come to a conclusion, in support please? I'm trying that. to get others and, in. And I do support what the broad support. If I'm allowed to take an amendment, well, I would I'm say not, to Mr. Mandel, I'm I'm, it's, I'd rather get the other members in if right. that's okay, and, and then you can do your summing up if that's appropriate. I appreciate it's an important debate, and I want to let others have their say. Joanne Lamont, followed by Margaret Mitchell. I, I would say, Deputy President, officer, that this is such an important um, discussion that if we um, encroached a little bit in the general debate around the bill, I don't think it would do the, the bill any harm. I think you may be reading my mind, Ms Lamont. I am allowing it to run. I do appreciate it's important. Thank you, I, and I appreciate your comments. And I rise to support the amendment, and I want to make a number of points. And I could just say to Stuart Stevenson, that might look like a good argument in paper, but it doesn't sound like an argument committed to the principle of this bill. It looks like a way out of the challenge rather than addressing the challenge. Now, I know the Minister has spoken about the difficulty of calculating the numbers. I'm sure survivors groups and survivors themselves would be able to support you in developing an understanding of the numbers. But are we saying that if the numbers are too high, we can't guarantee the rights that are enshrined in this bill? We are able in this Parliament to say that we will provide baby boxes without being ensured about the number of babies that are going to be born in the next year. The fundamental issue here is this. The fundamental issue here is this. If there is a right that we want across the chamber to exercise, then we need to find the means to deliver on that. Now, this idea that it's going to stop the legislation is simply not true. And I know people will be asking that genuinely because that is what they've been told. The advice we've had from SPICE, that that simply is not the case. But if it were the case, then why did the minister not bring forward a proposal that addresses the technical issues that she is identifying? She has the, she has the machinery of the state to find a way through this process. And I would also say to her, I will also say to her, there's a difference between saying something is difficult to calculate, calculate and unquantifiable. These are two different things. But if I can make progress, because this really does matter. We need to understand why this matters so much to survivors. This bill creates a right to justice denied for too long. There are survivors who have theoretically rights throughout their lives. Theoretically, they had a right to education, a right to protection from abuse, a right for families to protect them, for social work teachers and others to protect them, a right to a childhood. These were all rights that, in reality, that were denied to them. So it is understandable that survivors now ask that the right in this bill is not somehow, somehow not to be given that underpinning commitment. 
for this bill, without a commitment to ensure the resources to deliver these rights, will be yet another example to survivors of the gulf between the theoretical right that they have and the reality of their lives. And I say this in all seriousness to the Minister. This is a fundamental responsibility. In establishing a right, you need to will the means to deliver that right. And that is why it matters, because a right that is not enforceable in reality, is not a right at all. We know across this chamber I'm how sorry, we have I... all let people down. By supporting this amendment, we can give people the reassurance that we're not just saying we would like you to have that right. We will will the means to make sure that you have certainty that your rights will actually be delivered. Um, can I now call uh, Margaret Mitchell, followed by Mary Fee, please? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to support Oliver Mandel's amendment. Quite simply, Without a commitment that adequate resourcing will be available, there is a very real danger the much anticipated and eagerly awaited aims of this bill will not be realised. There, uh, there is no need at this stage to quantify the amount and a commitment to adequately resource would not delay its introduction. Frankly, if the political will is there, then the appropriate regulations can be laid tenuously. Presiding officer, it would be an absolute tragedy if at this late stage, survivors of historic childhood sexual abuse are let down. And if the, the government refuses to even consider that this, um, this resourcing, which is absolutely fundamental to the bill being effective, if they absolutely refuse to consider this as a possibility, then I think it's a very black day for this government. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In speaking to Oliver Mundell's amendment, I'd like to mention former MSP Douglas Ross's amendment, which was raised at stage two. I was unable to support the Douglas Ross Amendment at Stage 2 because that amendment would have required the Scottish Government to provide a full costing for the legislation before it could be passed. This would have been difficult as we were unsure of the full cost implications for local authorities and third sector organisations when establishing this information. And that amendment would, in effect, have stopped the bill in its tracks and for those reasons I could not support it. However, the amendment tabled by Oliver Mundell requires ministers to prepare a report showing that sufficient financial and other resources are available to help meet any obligation arising from this legislation. And this report should be laid before Parliament before the bill receives royal assent. And whilst it could be argued that the difference between the two amendments is slight, I will support Oliver Mundell's amendment because the government will have the time to prepare an indicative report of the resources that local authorities will require. And a report of this nature could potentially allow local authorities and other organisations affected to plan the resources that they will require. And this can only be a helpful progression to enable survivors of childhood abuse to feel confident that they will get the help that they require when raising claims. Thank you. Thank you. No other member has pressed a request to speak, so I call the minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government strongly opposes this amendment, which is largely the same as the amendment put forward by Douglas Ross at Stage 2, as has been referred to. It carries with it almost all the difficulties I raised at Stage 2. As before, this amendment is completely unworkable and has the potential of derailing the bill and thereby denying survivors the benefit of the bill. The amendment requires that before the bill is commenced, a report is laid before Parliament showing that sufficient resources have been made available to public bodies to meet any obligations arising further to the implementation of the bill. And although the, uh, I would like to make a bit of progress, thank you. I would like to make a bit of progress, thank you. Uh, and although the, the, the new formulation of the amendment is concerned with actions relating to a uh, abuse that took place before royal assent, uh, nonetheless, the, the basic uh, problems that the amendment generates for the coming into force of the bill uh, remain the same. Because as I made it clear at stage two, this puts us indeed into a catch-22 position. The impact of pre-existing abuse will not be known until after commencement, but the amendment would not allow us to commence the act until the impact was known, or perhaps until a blank check has been Written. It was clearly recognised, I would like to make a wee bit of progress, it was clearly recognised during the scrutiny of the bill that we cannot predict 
with any certainty what the impact will be. COSLA, Social Work Scotland, Police Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland and Aberdeen City Council have all made this point, which has been recognised by members of the Justice Committee. I'll take Mr Mundell. Mr Mundell. The Minister for giving way, but does she not recognise that in saying it's unquantifiable and she's not willing to write a blank cheque, that she's passing that burden on to others to write the same blank cheque? Minister. I don't accept that. Uh, and I would also uh, make, uh, stress the point, as I did stress at the committee, that COSLA, uh, and we have been in regular discussions at official level, uh, officials met with COSLA last week uh, to discuss these issues, and COSLA reiterated that they are not looking for blank cheques to be written. And I would also say, in terms of official uh, correspondence with uh, COSLA officials, COSLA have opined that they uh, see, agree that the amendment seems to be unworkable. That is the position of COSLA, that the amendment seems to be unworkable. So that might be something that the member may wish to uh, uh, consider. Uh, so all these players uh, giving evidence before the Justice Committee recognised that uh, uh, it would not be possible to come up with a specific uh, figure. COSLA also says there is undisputed recognition about the uncertainty of implementing this legislation. It is impossible to predict how many instances of abuse occurred in this time frame, how many survived Please may down, consider bringing a claim and then in turn how many claims may be brought against which organisations. Uh, the, the new version of the amendment, notwithstanding that it uh, applies now to harm that took place before the Act receives royal assent, as I say, uh, I've taken an intervention already, thank you, uh, does not, however, uh, solve the fundamental problem I have just described. The great uncertainty about impact applies to past cases as much as it does to future cases. Even where the abuse took place before royal assent, cases still might not be raised for some years into the future, in particular when we take into account the silencing effect of this uh, heinous abuse and the fact that for many survivors, it can take some 22 years to get to the stage that they are able to come forward. I understand that there are concerns about implications for local authorities and the importance of maintaining services at the highest standards. Uh, and as I say, my officials have been in regular uh, dialogue uh, with COSLA. COSLA recognise the difficulties involved and rather what they are looking for is continued dialogue about the impact. And I confirm that we will work uh, with COSLA and others to find the best way of monitoring the impact of the bill and how it should best be addressed. This amendment also contains a number of technical difficulties. Uh, in essence, the amendment is so uncertain in its effect that it would leave the validity of commencement regulations in doubt, issues regarding who is to determine what is sufficient or what happens if commencement is challenged once cases have already uh, concluded. Mr Mandel also said in his opening uh, comments that the amendment now applies only in circumstances where there is no insurance co cover available. Nowhere on the face of the amendment does it say that. In conclusion, uh, putting this condition on commencement runs the risk of preventing the bill coming into force. Parliament has unanimously supported the general principles of the bill and creating this unworkable requirement would appear to go against the will of the Parliament. We should not forget that survivors have campaigned long and hard for this change, amending the bill in a way that might risk frustrating the process would be disrespectful to survivors and their very long fight for justice. I urge members to reject amendment number one. I understand there's passions in this, but can I ask members to be respectful to each other? There are genuine views on all sides and I've let the debate run. I now call Oliver Mundell to wind up, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I have to say I am gobsmacked uh, by uh, the Scottish Government's complacency on this. It seems that they've missed what the very piece of legislation is about. Mm -hmm. If we can't guarantee that claims that come forward in 20 years' time are going to be paid, then what is the point in passing this legislation at all? This, is a, this, is a, this, is a, this gets right to the heart of it, and I'm disappointed but not surprised the Government won't support the amendment. Why would they? Why take responsibility for their actions just because they can. Last night we saw SNP backbenchers who were willing to break their party whip on the issue of tail docking. No. I can only hope that backbenchers will be as willing to listen to their conscience this afternoon. In particular, I would appeal 
to uh, Green and SNP members of the Justice Committee to make good on the recommendation we made on our report on this bill. The committee's report on the bill contains at paragraph 245 a recommendation that was unanimously agreed by all members of the committee. It says it is important that this bill is properly resourced to ensure that both its policy intent is achieved and to prevent any negative impact on the provision of current services by local authorities. I agree. Yeah. Joanne Lamont. If the, the member would agree with me that survivors want this reassurance and this bill wouldn't be here except for survivors fighting. And we know historically there were many organisations, many agencies, very many of the great and good said this cannot be done. We've proven it can be done. Now let's go the extra bit to make sure it's resourced. Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for that very passionate intervention. And she does make an important point because people in this chamber need to remember that those like us who have held elected office over a great many years have let these people down. We've let them badly down. And this legislation today wouldn't have been here if... What? Do you want to stand up or are you going to... Minister. I'm therefore very curious as to why when it is recognised by COSLA, by Aberdeen City Council, by the Law Society of Scotland, Police Scotland amongst other social work Scotland that you cannot quantify with exactitude the, the figure in terms of the potential impact of this bill, why it is that the member nonetheless wishes to go forward with an amendment that risks putting this bill into jeopardy and therefore letting down these survivors who have been so brave over so many decades in getting us all to this stage where we should be. Oliver Mundell. It's clear the Minister's got plenty to say now, but when the tough questions were being asked of her, she didn't want to answer. So perhaps, perhaps, she, could, perhaps she could stand up again and answer this question. I wonder if she could confirm how many of Scotland's 32 local authorities have adequate insurance cover for historic child abuse actions for the period in question? Just a minute, Minister, I have to I call you first. Presiding officer, I, I would, I've thought that the position should be uh, rather directed to each of the 30 local authorities, but of course, but of course, can I also just introduce, can I also perhaps I'd like to the introduce answers, please. A, an element of, of reality into, into Mr Mundell's thoughts, which this, is that obviously in terms of looking at each individual fact and circumstance, you would need therefore to determine on that basis whether there was insurance cover in place. Any meaningless kind of general statement along these lines is not helpful to individual uh, cases, and perhaps Mr Mundell might wish to reflect on that point. Mr Mundell. I reflect uh, carefully on that point and I would ask the Scottish Government in turn to reflect on the length of time it has had whilst this legislation has been progressing through Parliament to consider some of these points and secondly in answer to some of the other questions that have been posed by the Minister this report doesn't ask for an exact figure of the number of cases that comes forward it doesn't ask for a quantified amount of support and in correction to what both the Minister and Stuart Stevenson tried to suggest. It doesn't cover any uh, ob obligations that arise as a result of this. It's qualified, if you read the whole amendment, it says those obligations which are at prejudice to current services provided by, local, uh, by public bodies. Well, I'm glad you're coming through the chair because I was beginning to think of of a cup of tea while you both have a rammy across, across the chamber. Minister. I must apologise, Presiding Officer. Um, what I would do is, again, quote the actual terms of the amendment. The condition is that Scottish ministers have prepared and laid before the condition to, to actually bring the act into force, have prepared and laid before the Parliament a report showing that sufficient undefined financial and other resources have been made available to ensure that public bodies can, comma, without prejudice to the provision of services by those bodies, comma, meet any obligations arising from an action brought by virtue of the relevant provisions of the bill in question. That is what Mr Mundell's amendment says. Maybe he is not totally familiar with what actually he was trying to do. Mr Mundell. I, I think uh, it's the Minister who's not reading uh, the detail of the amendment. No, read, read, read. She, well, she's, read, she, she's read it out, but she hasn't understood what it means uh, on paper. And, and irregardless of that point, it simply asks for a report. A report. A report. It's not asking for the numbers. It's not asking for a specified amount. And it's not asking for a further vote on the quality of the report that's put forward. 
by agreeing to this amendment, we will be ensuring that full scrutiny is given to this legislation by this Parliament. This is not a wrecking amendment. It would not delay this legislation and it simply asks ministers to take accountability for the delay that has occurred on their watch for bringing these uh, changes forward. It asks them to underwrite the unexpected financial burden this might place on local authorities. And it asks them to ensure that vulnerable individuals in the care of the state today do not pay the price for the mistakes of the past. I believe the unwillingness of ministers to take that point seriously smacks of the very same cowardice and dithering from those in authority that has allowed this whole issue to be brushed under the carpet for too long. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He's aware that I'm not a member of the committee that scrutinised this in detail. Uh, and, presiding officer, I thought we were uh, coming here to, to listen to a debate where there was a good degree of consensus on the objective here. And I have to say, both to the member and, I'm sorry to say, to the minister, that I find it slightly unedifying to hear people now accusing each other of wanting to let down the victims of historic child abuse. I don't think that's the kind of debate that we ought to be having. Is he intending to address the question which has been raised that Kosla consider his amendment to be unworkable, something that he said in his opening remarks he hadn't asked them about? Mr Mundell. I thank the member for that intervention and I don't think that this debate's unedifying. I think that having spoken to survivors groups this morning, the very survivors who've been championing and campaigning for this, that they'd understand why this amendment was really important and what it offers them. And I think that COSLA, perhaps on the advice of the Scottish Government around what this amendment means, might have taken it, an opinion because it seems, it seems the Minister is so blinkered she's not, willing to consider, she's not willing to consider what a report actually means. I press the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Mundell. The question is, amendment one be agreed to, are we all agreed? We are not agreed there will be a division, as this is the first division of the stage I suspend for five minutes.
Thank you. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 1. This is a 30-second division and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 1 is as follows. The name of Oliver Mundell is as follows. Yes, 50. No, 65. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That concludes um, amendments. And I am required to read out, if you weren't here yesterday, if you're here, you probably don't want to hear it again. As members will be aware at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is now required, understanding orders, to decide whether or not in his view, any provision of the bill relates to protected subject matter. Put briefly, that is whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill would require support from a supermajority of members. That is a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that in his view, no, I'd like a bit of quiet while I'm reading. I know you may have heard it before. Thank you. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision of the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill relates to protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. And that is the debate. I think I'm reading the wrong bit. Could we The next item of business is a debate on motion 6201 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Can I ask those who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Annabel Ewing to speak to and move the motion no more than eight minutes please Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to open the Stage 3 debate on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill uh, and to invite members to agree to pass the bill. Uh, I thank members of the Justice Committee, the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, for their hard work and careful scrutiny of this hugely important bill. I also thank members for their comments on the bill during its passage uh, through the Parliament. And I also thank the organisations and individuals who provided oral and written evidence to the committee and briefings on the bill's provisions. Most importantly, presiding officer, I would like to thank survivors who have been at the heart of this process. I thank them for their bravery and their persistence, for bringing to our attention the plight and injustices that they have suffered, and for not giving up their fight to set these injustices right. I am humbled by the courage that they have shown, not only in campaigning for this legislative change, but also in coming forward and sharing their experiences. It is the survivors coming forward that has made this bill possible and the reason that we have reached this important milestone today. Uh, and can I just add, presiding officer, at this point that I was deeply saddened to learn that Frank Doherty passed away on 30th April of this year. Frank Doherty was a survivor who fought long and hard for the voices of survivors to be heard. And it is clear that we have lost an important witness and champion of survivors' rights. I would also like uh, to take the opportunity to make reference to the Scottish Human Rights Commission and to thank them for all their work over many years uh, on, on this uh, subject. Uh, as members will be aware, the bill stems from their interaction process and the action plan on justice for victims of historic abuse of children in care, which came out of that work. 
The action plan set out a number of recommendations and I am pleased uh, to be here today at the point of fulfilling a key commitment in response to those recommendations. I, I have welcomed, Presiding Officer, the uh, discussions that we have had on the bill as it has made its way through the parliamentary stages. The Justice Committee uh, evidence sessions highlighted a number of important issues, among them the definition of abuse and in particular as far as the issue of neglect is concerned. I am grateful to the witnesses and to the committee for raising this issue and recommending that we look at this again. I believe the amendment that uh, was passed at stage two that we put forward uh, to expressly mention uh, neglect in the definition has provided added clarity uh, to the bill for it ensures that there is no doubt that abuse in the form of neglect is covered by the defin definition of abuse in the bill. The committee evidence sessions also highlighted other issues in the bill, in particular in relation to inserted section 17C, which allows previously raised cases to be re-raised, and also inserted section 17D, which provides safeguards in line with the European Convention on Human Rights. I found these discussions helpful in re-examining the issues. With regard to section 17C, I noted the committee's suggestion that more clarity could be provided in the explanatory notes on the question of the burden of proof. And I can confirm, presiding officer, that changes have been made to the explanatory notes uh, in line with this recommendation. As I've mentioned before, this bill is about striking a balance, in particular, finding a balance between being inclusive and at the same time avoiding unintended consequences. I have made every effort to ensure the provisions in the bill are justified and are proportionate. On the important issue of prescription, I, I note and welcome the conclusions from the Justice Committee in this uh, regard in, in terms uh, of the issue of the law and prescription, which is relevant to abuse that took place before 26 September 1964. Because of the nature of the law on prescription uh, and human rights considerations, prescription will remain unchanged and the Committee agreed that this was indeed the right approach. However, I am aware that the issue of prescription has come as a great disappointment to many survivors and I regret that it is not something that the bill has been able to uh, address. However, as members will be aware, this bill is not the only step taken by uh, the Scottish Government to support survivors of childhood abuse and it is important to set this bill within the context of a number of other measures designed to improve the situation for survivors. In relation to survivors affected by the law of prescription, the current work to develop a consultation on the provision of financial compensation will include all in-care survivors within its scope. This work is being taken forward by Celsius in collaboration with the Interaction Action Plan Review Group, which includes survivor representatives. I am aware that this work is in its early stages with consultation expected to start later in the summer. Already up and running since October 2016 is the 13.5 million in-care survivor support fund, uh, now called Future Pathways. Older adults have been identified as a priority group since the inception of the support fund, along with people in distress. Demand for support has been encouraging, with more survivors than initially anticipated coming forward. In order to improve the responsiveness of the service and to address the needs of older and more vulnerable survivors who may not yet have come forward for support, Future Pathways is increasing the number of support coordinators to enable more responsive support to all. One of those coordinators will focus on the needs of priority groups such as older survivors. And I would like to take this opportunity to encourage all survivors of in-care abuse, regardless of age, to get in touch with Future Pathways. Other measures to support survivors of in-care childhood abuse include the National Confidential Forum, which continues to be a forum in which the voices of in-care survivors can be heard and acknowledged and understood. In October 2015, the Scottish Government established the Independent Child Abuse Inquiry to conduct an independent investigation of the abuse of children in care in Scotland. This is one of the widest ranging public inquiries that Scotland has ever seen and it began its first phase of hearings on 31st of May of this year. The Scottish Government also supported the Apology Scotland Bill, now Act, which came fully into force earlier this week. By protecting the giving of apologies in certain civil actions, the Act is intended to encourage changes in social and cultural attitudes towards apologising. In conclusion, presiding officer, this range of measures, along with the passing of this bill, will make a significant difference for survivors. And I am pleased to be here today at this uh, significant milestone. Presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees 
that the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I now call Oliver Mundell up to six minutes, please, Mr Mundell. And, um, John Lamont made the point about having time for the debate. And I wonder if I could move um, a motion without notice so that we extend decision time to 4.45 to make sure there is time for all the, the, the contributions to be made in this very important debate. I'm currently giving consideration to that and uh, I will send you a note and ask you to move it at the appropriate time. Thank you. And I call Oliver Mundell up to six minutes, please, Mr Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For many, today represents a historic day, not only in the life of this Parliament, but for our society as a whole. Today, we have the opportunity to right a historic wrong. While this legislation is no panacea, there can be no denying the significance, both real and symbolic, that changing the law will bring. For far too long, survivors and victims of abuse have been denied justice. I say survivors, but we must remember there are many who have not survived. As I have already said today, vile monsters have been allowed to hide behind the law, shielded by technical legal considerations which our state did not want to know about. Many, like us, have held elected office and have let these individuals down. And as we welcome this step forward, we must take our share of collective responsibility for the very grave failings of the past. There are many living amongst us who have had their lives destroyed, many who were in our care, who experienced no care at all, who have endured the unimaginable, who have been denied their childhood, and to call what has happened an atrocity is inadequate. And what is harder still to acknowledge and accept is that such acts continue to happen to this day. So on behalf of these benches, I want to say this, to all those who have experienced abuse, we are truly sorry. You have been wronged and nothing said or done in this place will ever put that right. But we must do what we can. And at the very least, we owe it to all of those who've gone before and all of those who are yet to come to give them their chance for their day in court. We owe them the right to seek justice, to bring these issues into the light and to demand that the perpetrators face the consequences of their actions. Of course, there will be disappointments. Of course, there will be cases which do not proceed due to a lack of evidence or because evidence has already been destroyed. And there will be further cases because of the delay in getting to this legislation where perpetrators are already dead. Having met with survivors over these past few months, having heard their stories, I will never forget the survivor who told me that the violence inflicted upon her had gone beyond the physical, beyond the psychological, and had destroyed part of her soul. However, she had not given in or given up. And like many who deserve our praise and admiration, she had the courage to speak out. It is the survivors who have delivered this legislation and forced change. They've campaigned tirelessly and vocally, and some in their own way have fought back by living their life as fully as they can. For them, this legislation sends out a message, a message which cannot be ignored. No longer will our legal system aid and abet those who deserve no mercy. That is a victory in itself. Those who have done wrong must be answerable and they do not get to put any time limit on justice. By removing the time bar, we're removing one of the barriers that stands in the way of victims. This legislation rightly recognises and acknowledges that for many survivors, any attempt at healing may take some time. For some, it will take years before they're ready to speak about their ordeal, to confide in another after their trust has been broken, and perhaps many more years before they can face the legal process. Many of us will never be able to comprehend the complexity of that process. So let us not be arrogant enough to imagine that today's legislation solves or addresses all of these challenges. While this is rightly a victory for campaigners, we as parliamentarians must consider this the start, not the end of a journey. There will always be more we can do. There is no room for complacency on our part. 
And let us remember that this legislation is not the answer for everyone. For example, it does not offer, as the Minister has outlined, the same opportunities for justice to those who suffered abuse prior to 1964. For reasons that others will uh, cover, it's not been legally possible to do so in the same way. But to end on a more positive note, it is clear that there are some who have suffered who are no longer afraid. And this change will help deliver the closure they are seeking. So in closing, I would simply like to personally urge ministers to reflect on what further steps can be taken to address this issue. And finally, in the same spirit, I would ask the government to keep an ever watchful eye on how the changes we are making today will work in practice and how they will be funded. Let us make sure that those who've campaigned so hard and those who have waited so long are not let down for a second time. Thank you. I now call Claire Baker. Up to five minutes, please, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am pleased that the bill has reached its final stage today. Uh, we should acknowledge that it's 10 years since Lord McEwan's comment in a judgment that I have an uneasy feeling that the legislation and the strict way the courts have interpreted it has failed a generation of children who have been abused and whose attempts to seek a fair remedy have become mired in the legal system. There is little I can do about it except to hope that reform will not be long delayed. It can be argued that it's taken too long to see this reform and there will be survivors for whom the legislation is too late. This legislation will give people choice, people who suffered terrible abuse as children, abused when they were supposed to be protected and had experiences which have hugely impacted on their lives as adults. It is an extremely difficult crime to acknowledge. It is only in recent years that child abuse has come out of the shadows and the increase in historic criminal cases demonstrates the legacy that Scotland is dealing with. The bill has been introduced in the shade of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, an inquiry which is vital for demonstrating transparency, accountability and responsibility. A challenging inquiry it has been problematic and hasn't been able to maintain the confidence of all survivor groups. While this bill extends new rights to survivors to pursue cases within the civil courts, it is not the path that all survivors will wish to take and it doesn't recognise the collective experience. It is crucial that the inquiry delivers answers and we can expose a culture that we no longer as a society are prepared to hide or tolerate. So we must now focus on supporting successful implementation of this Act. The Commission for a Parliamentary Reform report published this week recognises the importance of post-legislative scrutiny. This is a bill which we will need to be alert to. We are given people a new right and it is one that they must have confidence in. While the amendment today wasn't passed, the Government does need to address the ongoing concerns over costs. I appreciate that the Minister is having conversations with COSLA. But it is clear from the evidence to the committee that while there are anticipated costs of legal defence and action, there will be more significant costs involved in successful claims. The financial memorandum argues that there is an unquantifiable cost to the bill, but there will be a financial impact for defenders with continuing concerns over the ability to meet these costs from COSLA and others. These are important matters that the government needs to resolve. We have to recognise that insurance may be available in some cases, but that is not always going to be the case. And concerns have been raised over expired policies, companies that have folded and inadequate insurance policies in place. The government needs to recognise that this is a demand-led response and that they will have to work with others to make sure this is possible. While an authority will have responsibility, it is not by intent and the burden will be greater on some rather than others. The debate over the amendment today should focus the government's mind on ensuring sufficient resources and other f sorry, resources are available. The minister talked about the risk of a blank cheque at committee, but we don't want to be in a situation where we are suggesting that the amount of support available could be capped, that we are not able to respond to the demand that will be coming forward. I hope that today's debate can provide reassurance to survivors that this is not going to be an empty piece of legislation, but is going to be one that delivers rights for them that we can deliver on. Not all survivors will want to pursue a case, a case which can be difficult, could be disputed, could be traumatic. There was recognition and evidence that this could be a difficult task with all the normal practices of the legal system. But the bill does provide choice for survivors. 
We must ensure measures are in place to support people making an informed choice and that there is support for people who wish to pursue this course of action. How does the Minister anticipate support being made available to survivors who are bringing civil actions? And while the third sector offers support groups, how can we ensure that they are able to develop the knowledge and expertise on the Act? And are there plans for training opportunities or events that the Minister is aware of, or how does she plan to promote opportunities? There is also recognition of the need to accept that training may be required for the legal profession and the need to develop specialisms. And the cases coming forward will be complex and specialist courts were proposed and discussed in the evidence which the government could legislate for if they accepted the case and I hope they will give this some further consideration. I finally want to raise the issue of financial redress scheme um, for the merits of a financial redress scheme. The new legislation does not apply to people abused prior to 1964 and there is no civil action available to them. A financial redress scheme could be a way to recognise the abuse they suffered while in care and this is often a group of elderly and often frail survivors and a scheme aimed specifically at their needs would ensure they are provided with a level of redress while they could benefit from it and I urge the government to advance the work on this as soon as possible. This is an important piece of legislation. It is addressing an injustice for a group of people who deserve recognition and justice. And the law as it stands excludes them from the civil courts because they were young, vulnerable, abused when the crime took place. We must now ensure they are successfully able to use the legislation, if that is a decision they make, by ensuring that they are supported and that the act is properly resourced. Thank you. Before we move on, in order to allow all those who wish to contribute contribute to do so, I, I am minded to take a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to move decision time to 4.45, and I now invite the Minister uh, to move that motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much, Minister. I um, put the question to the Chamber. Are we all agreed to move decision time to 4.45pm? Yes. That's agreed, then. Decision time will be at 4.45pm. Now move on to the open debate. Uh, four minute speeches and still quite strict on timing here. Uh, Fulton McGregor to be followed by Miles Briggs. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Uh, as a member of the Justice Committee, I support this bill and agree that it will improve access to justice for survivors of historical childhood abuse. And I'd like to thank the Minister and Government for bringing this bill forward and all the members and witnesses who participated uh, during the committee's scrutiny. And during the committee, we dealt with many of the technicalities of the bill and, and did scrutinise it uh, fully. As I said, we heard evidence from a number of people, and as others have said, including Oliver Mundell, some of the most powerful uh, came from the survivors who presented to us. Uh, and although there are undoubtedly some shortfalls uh, of the bill, for me, though, this bill represents our continuing progress uh, as a nation, and it represents that we treat this issue with the utmost seriousness and we acknowledge that we got things wrong for victims in the past and we are on the right path to truly tackle the issue. It is absolutely right that the, bill should be, uh, the time bill should be removed for these type of horrible offences. We know that many, many people take years to disclose this sort of crime. Indeed, in my experience in social work, many people do not uh, speak about it, uh, childhood abuse until their parents themselves or even way beyond that. And it's not uncommon for um, services um, to... Um, to be working with a, a family and for the disclosure uh, to come out through that work and when the, maybe the, the terms of engagement, as I think I said before, uh, in the chamber was actually nothing uh, to do with that. The Moira Anderson Foundation is an organisation that undertakes a lot of work across Lanarkshire uh, and they have direct experience of working with victims who have taken years uh, to disclose. Today, um, I told them I was speaking in the, in the debate today and they, they told me about a service uh, user they have been working with over the last couple of years who will be directly affected uh, by the bill and have been given permission to share his story here. Um, they wrote to me uh, to say the Moira Anderson Foundation have supported a male in his, in his 30s for approximately two years now. The man was sexually and physically abused by a trusted adult while he was in his early teens. The abuse was very violent and threats were constantly made against his family should he have ever spoken up. The abuse, the abuse got so bad that his behaviour deteriorated and he ended up in, uh, in care where he actually fur, uh, suffered further abuse. The individual turned to alcohol and drugs as a way of blocking out the memories from the horrendous abuse. As an adult, his marriage and contact with children broke down due to these anger issues and also his huge distrust for people. The individual felt unable to go to the police because of a deep sense of shame he felt, being a male and a teenager, he felt that he should have been able to fight off his abuser. 
With the support of the Moira Anderson Foundation, he went on to make a statement to the police. And during his interview, he disclosed sexual abuse in care, as well as physical abuse. And the abuse had been undisclosed even to the Moira Anderson Foundation before that point. And that shows that despite the trust he built up with the worker from that organisation, there was still more abuse that he hadn't been able to disclose until very recently. Uh, and, he and he would never been able uh, to speak to the police earlier uh, than he did, because he, he wasn't in the right place. So he's been able to speak to the Moira Anderson Foundation uh, about that. And I know when I contacted them today, they said that they have actually been discussing uh, this bill's progress through Parliament uh, with this individual. So when we sit here in this chamber and we pass bills, some it's actually directly affected like that. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's what it's all about. And, and he'll, uh, he'll be able to, to take advantage, hopefully, of the, of the bill. Um, it, I, I, really, I, I do believe that this bill takes the correct steps that are needed to ensure access to justice is available to survivors uh, of historical abuse. It is vital we continue to explore measures in which survivors uh, of abuse have the support and means to deal with the effects felt from childhood. At present, uh, as we have said before in this chamber, individuals are not able to bring cases uh, to civil court after three years, including side effects uh, such as uh, PTSD, anxiety and depression. And survivors currently face barriers in attempting to access the civil justice system. I can see that my time's running out, um, presiding officer. So I'll just conclude. I had more to say, but I'll just conclude by saying that I am, um, although I didn't agree with the amendment, I think that it was well, uh, well placed by Oliver Mundell, and I think that overall the whole Parliament and every party has been in support of this. And let's take that forward and let's make sure that it works. Thanks very much. Mr. McGregor, your time wasn't running out; it had run out. Could, could I ask everyone else to take note of that, please? Miles Briggs to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in today's Stage 3 debate, and I'd like to thank members of the Parliament's Justice Committee and other colleagues for their work on previous stages of the Bill, including a thorough and useful Stage 1 report. I also thank the external organisations who've contributed briefings and materials during the legislative process. Scottish Conservatives have consistently supported this Bill in principle and in its aims, and we continue this support at decision time tonight. It's right that this Parliament removes the three-year limitation or time barrier so that the survivors of child abuse will no longer have to undertake the additional and potentially very difficult task of persuading a court to overrule the limitation period. The need for the bill was clearly demonstrated in the Justice Committee's Stage 1 report. It is also evidenced by the fact that the discretion allowed in existing law through the uh, Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973 has only ever been used once since the Act was passed, now some 44 years ago. The Faculty of Advocates and other organisations have warned that the removal of the time bar will lead to an increase in court actions, possibly a significant increase, many of which are likely to be extremely complex. This is something that the Justice Committee also identified in its report. The number of potentially complex um, cases coming forward and additional cases will inevitably lead to resource implications as been outlined in our courts and I think that's something we really need to recognise going forward. This was the reasoning behind my former colleague um, Douglas Ross's amendment at stage two and Oliver Mundell's amendment uh, this afternoon. I'm disappointed obviously that the Scottish Government chose not to accept this amendment but I would hope that ministers um, will keep this subject under constant and very close review and be ready to take the necessary action required to ensure that our court system is always appropriate re appropriately resourced and supported. Ministers will be aware of the Health and Sport Committee's recent inquiry into child protection in sport following the, following the BBC Scotland investigation. Um, re revealing allegations of young football players having been sexually abused by coaches during the 1970s, 80s and 90s. Although the committee inquiry focused on the current safeguards in place for children and young people in Scotland today, it was clear and has been clear from the individuals who have contacted me privately that the public airing of these historical allegations may now see a real increase in historical cases coming forward. Childhood abuse is incredibly difficult for people to revisit and to talk about at any stage in their lives. However, it is vital that we send out a message today to victims who have suffered abuse that they will be listened to and that we will put in place the resources needed to support them when they decide to come forward. It's very important that survivors of childhood sexual abuse who do indeed decide to take forward civil claims do not then, then face unacceptable delays due to the lack of resource in the court system. I'd also wish to join other members 
in urging the Scottish Government to continue to look at how it will address the rights of survivors of abuse which took place before 1964 and I welcome what the Minister had to say when she covered this. Um, to conclude, Deputy President Officer, I again wish to support this bill which takes appropriate action to ensure, ensure our legal system recognises that victims of child abuse are a unique category of pursuer since the nature of their abuse means they often do not come forward with claims until many years after that abuse has actually taken place. This bill will, I hope, send out a clear message that our parliament and government want to do all we can to support the victims of ch childhood abuse, and I'm confident it can and will make a real difference to many survivors as they look to take forward court action. Delivering justice for those who have suffered is vital, and I hope that the passing of this bill today is another step towards truly delivering this for those who have suffered at the hands who we entrusted to protect and care for them. Thank you. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by John Finney. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say that I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate and recognise that across the Chamber people do want to make this legislation work and we wouldn't be in this position if there hadn't been long, hard arguments about how you might deliver justice for people who, precisely because of the nature of the abuse they suffered and at the time in their lives they suffered it, were routinely denied justice. I just want to say something very briefly about the amendment, because while there were those who voted against the amendment on the basis they believed that the, the legislation would be stalled, it's also true that those who supported the amendment believed it was necessary in order to give people confidence that resources matched the, the theory of the um, the legislation and so I don't diminish the judgment of those who voted the way they did but please don't think that anybody who supported the amendment wanted to do it do so in order to prevent that legislation being enacted and I've heard the phrase if, I've heard the phrase blank check but we wouldn't want a bounce check either and that is why the question of resources really matters and it isn't just about dialogue with COSLA or whomsoever is about Scottish Government underpinning and committing to finding resources to ensure that these rights are real for people in their lives. Because we have to recognise the role of survivors and survivors groups. Those who understood the diverse needs and experience of survivors and have stood with them. Not just survivors who themselves found their voices, but those people who, when it wasn't something that was so readily understood, stood with them and gave voice for them to their suffering who saw the patterns of behaviour, the women's organisation, who saw the, pattern, the connections between domestic abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse, and insisted that the political process understood it was something to do with them at a time when many organisations said, this is not our business, this is not the business of the state. That is their victory, and we should recognise that. It's important to understand the journey, that there was a time that it was simple denial that abuse actually occurred. A system where perpetrators were moved on to abuse again rather than to confront what was happening. The refusal to listen and indeed to hear when young people were telling them what was happening. And how many young people were silenced, left to continue suffering and were often scapegoated, if not in their own homes, but in the schools and within the care system where they found themselves. But blamed for their own abuse. Their poor behaviour as a consequence of their abuse being used to explain why they were in the situation that they were in. And there is a bit of unfinished business, Minister, in relation to those professionals who had a duty of care during that time, when there were policies already talking about abuse, who did not speak up for young people or understand properly what was being told to them. And I mention this because what seems now as an inevitable progress and journey was not always so, and we do not recognise that that journey was long fought for or understand the scale and pernicious nature of such abuse, how it might reveal itself, the long-term suffering it can cause, then justice will be denied. And we will see institutions again saying, this is too difficult. We have to understand now as we see revelations about football, about sports clubs, about community groups, about young people in care and in our home, the truth is predators, predators take many forms and we should not put these into silos. We need to talk about why and how the abuse of power is created and experienced in order that we can protect our young people in the future. And in conclusion, I just want to say very briefly on the question of the survivor's strategy. We understand and recognise the inquiry and it is important. 
But there are those whose suffering does not come within the remit of the historic abuse inquiry. And wherever the abuse was suffered, it's essential that there is a proper survivor strategy to support survivors wherever they are. We need to understand that for some, they are not ill, but they need support and emotional support at particular times in their lives. They grieve the loss of their childhood, of the potential they had as young adults, and they deserve support. And finally, and I know the government supports this position, we have to have provision for survivors, we have to have protection through the justice system, but we also have to pre have prevention by talking about abuse and ensuring that those who would perpetrate abuse against others understand the scale of society's hostility to that and our determination to ensure that it doesn't happen. I'm grateful to the government for the work they have done to get the bill to the stage and we look forward to supporting it at decision time. Can I ask the Chamber to note that I may have to cut down other speeches because members are running over time and I call John Finney to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I think it was Oliver Mundell that used the term historic and certainly a lot of people will view this legislation as that and uh, I would like to thank everyone who participated. I'm a member of the Justice Committee who participated with our scrutiny of this legislation, particularly the survivors. And, um, we took testimony in private and uh, whilst um, the identity of the individuals will rightly remain anonymous, I think it's entirely appropriate to record that they were very worthy ambassador for, for their, 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 their group and uh, we learnt a lot from them. And there's a lot of excellent organisations offering support to uh, childhood abuse survivors. And I'd also like to, to comment on the police and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and the role they're playing. And we've seen it also in relation to sexual crimes and crimes like domestic violence, where a very proactive approach that's taken by the police gives people the confidence to come forward. Um, and um, people have talked about the resources that are behind the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. The Justice and Committee has also done an inquiry into that, and it's, it's very important that the people who support, in the broadest sense, uh, survivors uh, have uh, the proper resources. Um, Scottish uh, Human Rights Commission's Action Plan and Justice for Victims of Historic Abuse of Children and Care has been mentioned, and also I'd like to uh, talk about, uh, or at least commend, the National Confidential Forum. I want to quote from the briefing the Scottish Human Rights Commission gave us at the outset of the legislation, and it said, judicial and other remedies for human rights breaches must be practical and effective and equally accessible in practice as well as law. This requires that they should be appropriately adapted so as to take account of the special vulnerability of certain categories of person. Legal limitation and claims may render the remedy ineffective. So I, 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 as someone who takes a rights-based approach to everything, I think the retrospective application of this bill is, is, is unusual. We've talked about the prescription uh, and uh, the phrase somewhere if it deems equitable to do so, well, the legal system only deemed it equitable to, on one occasion to, to, to set that aside. So it's a, entirely appropriate that we have a, a special uh, limitations regime. Um, right to fair trial is a, is a human right, and of course that, that is both sides of the equation. It's rights uh, to everyone. Um, and uh, th I think this is very, that applies equally to the pursuer and defender in a, a civil case. And this is very positive legislation. Um, and removing the time bar certainly removes one of the hurdles to justice, but simply one of the hurdles to justice. And I think, as I said in the stage one debate, simply having legislation in itself is not sufficient. We need a range of, uh, uh, indeed, a special regime for childhood abuse. Uh, a couple of things very quickly. I welcome the definition of the child as being under 18. Uh, um, uh, that, that we're seeing that reflected in other legislation. It's clearly an emotive subject, this. We've, we've heard that today. It's about addressing the wrongs of the past and moving to a positive future. There are challenges. Uh, there are challenges uh, uh, around what we know. For instance, uh, some people view things as a commercial challenge. We've heard from the insurers and their concerns about people coming forward. But I think we have to remember when we talk about statistics, when we talk about numbers, we are talking about individuals all with a particular experience. And the way ahead is about prevention, as others have talked about. That is about education, and I think there's a lot of good education taking place in our schools. It's about obligations to challenge. It's about whistleblowing policies. It's about people feeling that they can challenge if they see wrong. As regards older survivors, I'm sometimes involved with an organisation called Simba that helps people who have suffered from stillbirths. And I met a woman in her late 40s who had never had that support 
um, and uh, many years, in fact, it was 40 years after the event she came forward. People can always gain support. I would hope people would come forward. There are other uh, initiatives on the go. Domestic Abuse Bill is something where the, the, the position of children is, is important. And if I may do one plug as in the last eight seconds, the Equal Protection Bill, which I'm bringing forward, is something that will protect children from assault by corporal punishment and will bring in equal, equality there. So I hope that will gain support in the future. Thank you. May I have Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind uh, my colleagues of my register of interests in my career in the residential childcare sector before coming to this place? Coming to terms with the depth and extent of historic abuse has been the darkest awakenings for our generation. As a society, we have failed untold numbers of those entrusted to the care of charities and churches, schools and social clubs who, in the course of the care and supervision they should have enjoyed to the highest standards, were let down and damaged in the most horrific ways imaginable. We can never hope to know the full extent of this suffering, but we can, by our actions in this place today, offer at least some access to justice and, by extension, an element of peace to those victims who can now finally tell their story. Whilst I'm standing in for my colleague Liam MacArthur today, who can't be here, and as such was not party to the proceedings of the committee and the powerful evidence I understand it received, I have worked amongst both providers of care and survivors of abuse for much of my working life. I understand the dehumanising and savage impact that abuse can have on, on lives of any age. As the committee heard, it can take an estimated 22 years on average for a survivor of abuse to feel able to come forward and talk openly about their abuse and the impact this has had on their lives. As such, the very existence of a time bar against civil proceedings saw a barrier to justice baked into our legal system. And as with so many aspects of indemnity in our society, was tilted towards protecting providers from litigation than protecting the rights of individuals to seek justice in a time frame of their choosing. Presiding officer, we live in a time where the walls that have protected abusers and cultures of abuse, historic though they may be, are steadily coming down. But in the cases of historic abuse, while the pursuit of criminal justice against the perpetrators of such abuse has no time restraint, victims have faced such a restriction in obtaining satisfaction and redress through the civil courts. This bill rightly rectifies this on cases of abuse after 1964. In the evolution of this bill, presiding officer, we have rightly seen an expansion around both definition and of settings to shift the focus of legislation to the vulnerability of the victim rather than stage on which the abuse took place. This puts us in step with the tenets of international best practice and indeed human rights law. Similarly, ensuring that the definitions of abuse against which justice can be sought have rightly been expanded to include all forms of abuse. And I am hugely gratified that following contributions of my colleague Liam MacArthur and other colleagues like Mari Evans during the stage one debate, the government to its credit saw fit to move in a amendment at stage two which will see the inclusion of neglect as a justifiable offence against which victims might seek civil redress. This too brings us closer to the meeting the test of international gold standards. Presiding officer, this has been a consensual debate. I am heartily grateful for that. It is a, it is a short but essential piece of legislation which will have wide-ranging implications for people who have lived in the shadow of an appalling thing that happened to them who have suffered in the knowledge that their abusers were protected by organizations and institutions who so singularly failed in that crucial first line of their duty of care to them, and who in some cases fostered a culture of silence and complicity. This has been a time of uncomfortable revelation in the course of our nation's story, but I am confident in the passing of this legislation today, it will be seen as a time of long overdue justice as well. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Perhaps uh, I should start by talking about colleagues in the Chamber here. Um, I've always thought that uh, all of us who stand for Parliament for elected office, whatever our political traditions and beliefs, uh, we all come here, with almost no exceptions, wanting to do good for the people that we are elected to represent. That doesn't change the fact that I will have fundamental disagreements with colleagues in other parts of the chamber on matters that are important to me. But in a matter like this today, 
I'm gratified to find that as we reach the conclusions of the Limitation of Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill, we are likely to find ourselves of a single mind. Um, I've no difficulty with the motivation that caused uh, Oliver Mundell to bring his amendment forward today. Indeed, after uh, it, the amendment fell at stage two in committee, uh, I had discussions uh, precisely about how a new amendment might look. At the end of the day, the amendment we got wasn't quite there. But that's only a personal opinion and doesn't matter very much in the big scheme of things. I also want to pay tribute to Joanne Lamont, um, like myself, has been here for some considerable time. She has been a tireless campaigner, in fact, on occasion, an extremely irritating but proper campaigner uh, for the rights of the disadvantaged in our society. And uh, although we heard some pretty robust words today, the motivation behind them was motivation we should utterly, utterly uh, respect. So we are one mind in terms of being here uh, to support uh, this particular uh, amendment. The debates we have here and the disagreements we have here will not be understood in any way, shape or form uh, by the people that we are seeking to help. Their attitude is very simple. Could we just get on with it and do something? And I think that's uh, where we've got to. Uh, in committee, we heard from people who did suffer childhood abuse. It was moving beyond belief. Uh, and I say that as somebody who, with a, I always refer to my history, of course, my GP father, who experienced in his life uh, some examples of childhood abuse that he had to deal with. In particular, uh, he was uh, a GP uh, responsible for uh, pupils in a boarding school. And within that context, there was precisely some examples of this. That was discussed around the dinner table because it was thought that we as children should understand uh, what goes on, and our views were actually sought by my father. But nothing that was discussed around our dinner table compared with the real stories that we were told as individuals. It didn't quite move me to tears, but there was only one reason for that. I did not want to let down the person who was telling their story by my tears. I felt like crying. I really did, and I know that others uh, were in that uh, same position. So it is a noble and proper thing that we do uh, today, something that has been needing to be done for a very long time. Now, in conclusion, presiding officer, let's not imagine that when we put words on a page in our statute book that we've completed the job. That's, of course, not the case. We've got to make sure the resources are in place, and I signed up for that part of the committee report that said that, and I'm confident that will happen. But there are new threats coming over the horizon that we will have to engage with as well. Immediately before this debate, I had an hour's briefing from the Internet Watch Foundation, who are precisely involved in addressing the issue of uh, children abuse on the Internet. There are new threats coming. We must remain alert to those and protect future generations from new threats, as well as properly today addressing threats in the past. Presiding officer. I call Jeremy Balfour uh, to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> we'll just wait till Mr. Balfour puts his card in. <laughs> Apologies, President <Hi>. Officer. <laughs> uh, Officer I, I want to keep my speech fairly short uh, this afternoon because I think many members have already expressed a lot of what I had written down, and I want to give others a chance to speak. But I would like to raise just a couple of issues. I think we've heard a very consensual debate. But I think a number of witnesses questioned the assumptions made in the financial memorandum um, in evidence given to the committee. Police Scotland suggested it would be appropriate to carry out a further scope and exercise, suggesting a figure of 2,200 cases that could be brought forward initially was of a conservative estimate. And I do hope the government will do that work that is required at an early stage. Another concern that was shared by some witnesses at stage one was the capacity of the court system to deal with these cases. It is important that people who have waited for many years then raise an action are not discouraged by lengthy and potential avoidable delays. And I would be interested to know perhaps from the Minister and from the Government going forward, how they 
can see that working in a court system that is already very busy. The Faculty of Advocates have suggested there will be more cases and restraining the courts could be a time bar for cases actually getting to be heard. And we need to make sure that there are the right resources there for our court system going forward. Some concerns were raised about the potential negative impact on survivors by going to court. And I think we have already heard from others this afternoon that this will not be the road of action for everybody. The Faculty of Advocates again raised the significant emotional impact on those raising actions and said litigation is inherently stressful and could do more harm than good. And if people are brave enough to come forward and to raise these appropriate actions, we need to make sure that the support is there to help them through the complex legal procedures. It is important that people who have waited for many years to raise an action are not discouraged by lengthy and potentially avoidable delays. That is why I believe it is vital and why I want to make the same point as I made at stage one debate, that with the introduction of this legislation, there must be the appropriate support and advice to assist victims and survivors of childhood abuse. The Scottish Government must give the appropriate considerations of not only financially making sure that the, the right things are in place, but also the emotional support as well. It is our duty as Parliament to ensure that the Bill meets the aspirations of the people who have suffered childhood abuse. Having waited so long for this opportunity, it is incumbent on each of us and every one of us to give the, the victims the best legislation that is within our gift, but also to make sure that what happens after this legislation gets royal assent is also the best in place. Thank you very much. Rona Mackay is the last of the open debate speakers. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the bill being brought before Parliament today is so important to thousands of the most vulnerable and wronged people in our society. They've been barred from gaining access to justice simply because they were unable to bring forward a civil action within a three-year period. At the outset, I'd like to thank the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee for their courage and bravery. It was difficult for us to hear, but it must have been agonising for them to recount, and I cannot commend them highly enough. They spoke out so that never again would these vile crimes be covered up to ensure that there's no hiding place for abusers. Presiding officer, three years is not long enough for survivors to garner the strength to proceed with civil action against their abusers. They've been emotionally terrorised, stricken with fear and guilt and simply need longer to attempt to deal with what has happened to them. Because this isn't a court action about neighbours fighting over land or suing a company for damages, it's about seeking recognition and an apology for being robbed of a childhood and sentenced to a lifetime of unimaginable emotional distress. The terrible abuse survivors suffered during childhood, sexual, physical and mental abuse was a life sentence. I am also pleased that the bill was amended at stage two to include neglect, such a damaging form of abuse with lifelong effects. The cruelty bestowed upon survivors, often by people they trusted and who were entrusted to care for them, left them feeling worthless and violated. Presiding officer, some have raised concern that this bill will open the floodgates to those seeking compensation, which will be costly, which was at the root of Oliver Mundell's amendment. Apart from being unworkable, this amendment would have delayed justice to many survivors and sent out entirely the wrong message that they will get justice only if those ultimately responsible could afford it. However, I know this is, was certainly not the intention of Oliver Murdell's uh, amendment or those who supported it. And I'd like to commend Oliver for his moving and heartfelt speech. And I also agree with Joanne Lamont's uh, comments about the need for a survivor's strategy. Presiding officer, like my colleague Stuart Stevenson, I'm sure there isn't a single person in this chamber who doesn't support this bill. But the reality is that at this stage, the number seeking access to justice for historical crimes is unknown and estimates vary widely. It's not a panacea for survivors. The Scottish Human Rights Committee believe the vast majority of survivors will not go down the civil court justice route. Many survivors simply couldn't face the prospect of resurrecting the horrors that they've kept locked away in a box throughout their lives and bringing it to court will never be the answer for them. 
And we also found a common thread throughout the testimonies. Most survivors will not, would not do this for the money, even if they brought it to court. Many simply want the perpetrators brought to justice an apology for the terrible injustice and violation they suffered. They've been so emotionally damaged. Many have been so emotionally damaged they've been unable to attain a good standard of living. Their financial potential has not been realised and they've struggled to make ends meet. But how can you put a price on what any of them have suffered? It's simply too hard for any of us to imagine. So in conclusion, presiding officer, if this bill brings any light at the end of a long, dark tunnel for some survivors, then I'm happy to commend it to the Parliament. Now move to the closing speeches, and I call Mary Fee. Four minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I begin my contribution by reaffirming the support of these benches for the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill? And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the government, the minister, and the external organisations for their input throughout the committee's evidence sessions. At stage one of the bill proceedings, I praised the outstanding bravery of the survivors of childhood abuse for their input throughout the bill process. And today, I think it's important that I repeat my admiration for the survivors in helping to bring this bill forward. Without their bravery, their patience, their cooperation, the limitations bill would not have been possible. And in the committee, we heard from a range of stakeholders that removing the time bar creates choices that some survivors will find preferable, but some may not. And at stage one, I called for the right support to be made available to survivors in setting out their options. And I cannot stress the importance of this enough. In taking action through courts, the survivor will have to face a series of obstacles in providing evidence and reliving the horrors that they faced. And that's why Laura Dunlop QC warned that some action could do more harm than good, a quote that I highlighted at stage one, and one that I believe must be re-emphasised. It is of the utmost importance that all survivors have access to support and guidance which is tailored to their needs throughout the whole process and for as long after the process as they require to ensure they do not suffer more trauma. And, Presiding Officer, I welcome and thank the Minister for the amendment which was lodged at Stage 2. As Alex Cole Hamilton said, that ensuring that neglect is covered in the definition of abuse gives certainty that many of those who provided evidence to the committee have asked for. And whilst neglect was covered in the first publication of the bill, giving the term its own place provides clarity for survivors, as Liam MacArthur highlighted at Stage 2. And the inclusion of neglect rightly widens the scope of the bill and reflects the evidence that we heard and the concerns that were raised about the definition by the survivors themselves. And this wider definition ensures maximum support and protection for all survivors. And, presiding officer, today is a historic day. The passing of the Limitations Bill will provide redress that thousands of survivors of childhood abuse have been unable to access for decades. And it is clear from this afternoon's debate that all parties represented in this chamber are committed to the principles and passing of the Limitations Bill. And no contribution, I think, was more powerful or more pers persuasive today than that of Joanne Lamont. And there is a clear consensus that the appropriate support must be available to all survivors who decide to pursue civil action. And in addition, all survivors have guidance if they choose to take a claim forward. And in closing for Scottish Labour today, I would like to reaffirm our support for the Limitations Bill and once again thank each and every survivor for their bravery, their patience and their support during the legislative process of the Limitations Bill. From the consultation process through to the passing of the bill today, the bravery, the patience and the support that survivors have shown has been commendable. Thank you. Before we move on, can I remind members that if they contribute to the debate, they should be in the chamber for the beginning of the closing speeches. And I call Margaret Mitchell. Around five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
I welcome this legislation which aims to increase access to justice for survivors of childhood abuse and want to begin by paying tribute to these survivors who have, who have over many years lobbied for the three-year limitation period for claims of historical child abuse, also known as time bar, to be abolished. And as Rona Mackay and Mary, McPhee, and Mary Fee both said, it took considerable courage for these survivors to give evidence to the Justice Committee, and we were certainly most appreciative of that. I also want on a personal basis to acknowledge and thank the members of the cross-party group on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse for their valued input into this issue. The removal of the three-year time bar for specific cases involving historic childhood abuse puts an end to a previously insurmountable barrier for survivors and in doing so implements a change for the better. However, the Minister and other contributors have stressed it is important to note that pursuing a civil action will not be the right solution for all survivors. And in this sense, as others have said, the bill will sadly not be a panacea. It is therefore essential that the expectations surrounding pursuing civil action are managed in an effort to avoid raising false hopes, while at the same time ensuring that alternatives, which were referred to by John Finney, to civil court processes are um, highlighted. One of the main alternatives is the Apology Scotland Act, which coincidentally came into force on Monday 19th of June. This is legislation I introduced as a member's bill, which was not just welcomed, but actively promoted by survivors on the cross-party group. So it's a matter of immense sadness to me that the government's secondary legislation proposed and passed, which involved complex issue, potent issues, potentially thwarts that, uh, the aims of the Act. In terms of the scrutiny of the limitations bill, itself, the provisions which raised most concern were Section 17C and 17D. Section 17C allows for certain past cases which have been disposed of by decree of absolvitor to be re-raised. Here the concern was that this could lead to a breach of defenders' human rights in terms of their right to a fair trial and the right to peaceful enjoyment of their possessions. Furthermore, by of overturning a decree absolvator, there was a very real concern that this in turn would undermine a fundamental principle of Scots law. Section 17D provides a safeguard for defenders in an attempt to ensure their convention rights are not breached. However, despite the Minister's reference to an adjustment to the explanatory notes and her assurances that these provisions will not set a precedent for other areas of law, it's fair to say these concerns remain. This being the case, if this legislation is passed this evening, it will be down to the courts to decide. Scrutiny issues were also raised in terms of the absence of detail regarding the bill's financial resources, uh, resource implications. For example, in relation to the administration, administrative burden this bill may place on public bodies, a point which Oliver Mundell sought to address in his amendment and in his contribution to this debate. As Joanne Lamont, Claire Baker, Miles Briggs, Jeremy Balfour and others pointed out, the financial implications um, for, of the bill on local authorities, charities and support services still require to be addressed and resolved and adequate resourcing was a feature of a number of contributors' um, statements. In conclusion, presiding officer, notwithstanding the concerns outlined above, the bill helps achieve access to justice for survivors of historic childhood abuse by removing the time bar obstacle and the whole parliament can celebrate that fact. I can therefore confirm that the Scottish Conservatives will support the bill at decision time this evening. Thank you very much and I call the Minister Annabel Ewing to wind up. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been an important and constructive uh, debate at stage three and I would like to thank all members for their contributions uh, to which I listened carefully and for supporting and indicating their support uh, for the passing of this bill uh, this evening. 
This bill is an important step, as has been recognised, in ensuring access to justice for survivors of childhood abuse. For the bill is designed to remove a barrier which in the past has proved, in effect, impossible to overcome uh, for survivors. The bill acknowledges the unique position of survivors, recognising the abhorrent nature of the abuse, the vulnerability of the child at the time and the profound impact of abuse. In passing the bill today, Parliament will be recognising that survivors have been let down repeatedly. They were severely and fundamentally let down by their abuser and by the adults who were meant to protect them at the time. But they have also been let down by a justice system which has effectively denied them access to a remedy. Of course, it is acknowledged, and indeed has been acknowledged by many members uh, this afternoon, that raising a civil action may not be the right way forward for everyone. Each individual survivor would have to take their own view. However, what this bill does is to widen the options available to survivors seeking redress. Of course, raising a civil action is still, uh, of course, a, a challenging task. And I, I do agree with, with members uh, who have pointed out uh, today and in previous uh, debates on this bill uh, the importance of ensuring survivors are supported. Support works best if based on individual needs. And this means that the most effective support will be different for each individual survivor. Through the Survivor Support Innovation and Development Fund, which has a budget of 1.8 million for this financial year, we fund third and voluntary sector organisations to provide a wide range of services, including practical and emotional support, information provision, creative therapies, counselling, employability, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support and befriending programmes. It is also, of course, important that, uh, as has been mentioned, survivors are able to access quality legal advice. Survivors will be able to apply for legal aid and will no longer be required to demonstrate a reasonable prospect of success in overcoming the time bar hurdle, a hurdle which has proved in effect insurmountable survivors in the past. We are also uh, working with the Law Society of Scotland to ensure that solicitors are well placed to support survivors through the legal process, including looking at what training could be made available. The impact, potential impact on the courts has been raised uh, in the debate this afternoon by a number of members. Uh, and what I would say that in the same way that we cannot quantify at this stage the potential impact on local authorities and other bodies, we cannot with absolute certainty say what the impact will be on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. In terms of the estimates that we do have, uh, including those relating to when cases would be lodged, uh, which are presented in the financial memorandum, uh, further to recent uh, discussions that officials have had with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, um, they are of the view that these cases could be absorbed within current business programming. There is, of course, no certainty around these numbers, as we have previously discussed at length. Uh, we are in ongoing discussions with the Court Service on how best to monitor the impact and will consider any issues uh, that may arise. The impact on local authorities and on third sector and voluntary organisations has of course been a key theme in the consideration of this bill and in uh, uh, today's uh, debate. Uh, and it is important to keep in mind that COSLA and many uh, third sector organisations do absolutely support the bill. As I have made clear before, I do recognise that there will be financial and other uh, resource implications and that costs might go beyond the costs that are directly associated with defending actions However, as we have uh, discussed uh, in detail earlier this afternoon, at this point in time, it is not possible to say what these costs will be. That is why I have committed to keeping the situation under close review and to carefully considering the evidence of the impact of the bill. Uh, with regard to other issues raised in terms of the position of the uh, ability to look at previously litigated cases, decree, decree of declarator, and so forth. I, I would say in summary that this bill has been about striking a balance, a balance as between the, the respective rights of the survivor and the rights of course of the defender. We do believe that we have found uh, the correct balance uh, and we feel uh, that we have demonstrated that in the presentation of these provisions in the bill and in ensuring that we are saying this is the mechanism by which the courts must make this assessment. So we do feel that we have uh, worked very hard to find that balance uh, and I'm pleased to note that that is the view of many members in the chamber.
In conclusion, presenting officer, I, I would like once again to thank the Justice Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the bill and all of those who provided written and oral evidence. I would like to thank again the Scottish Human Rights Commission for their extensive work in this area and all other individuals and organisations who have engaged in this process. And as I said in my opening remarks, and most importantly, I would like to thank all survivors whose bravery and persistence has secured this proposed legislation that we are about to vote on this evening. I am proud to be here today to uh, support the passing of this bill. We should not underestimate the significance of the message that we are sending here today. That is a message that we will always seek to support and respect those in society who have been harmed and that access to justice for all of our citizens is at the heart of our values. Presiding officer, I ask that members support the motion and agree the passing of the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll come to decision time at 16.45. Uh, and there'll be one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is on the, uh, the motion to pass the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. Just to explain uh, that we will have a division on this vote. We won't just ask whether members agree or not. That's because under the new procedures, uh, although Parliament has decided that we don't need a supermajority for this bill, that decision is challengeable. And the only way it's not challengeable is if you actually register that two-thirds of members eligible have voted for the bill, i.e. 86 members. Oh, did you all follow that? Yes, of course we did. What it means is we can't just pass the bill by acclamation. We have to have a vote, a division. And on that note, we will now move to a, vision, a division. The question is that motion 6201 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 6201 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 115, no, zero. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Point of order from Finlay Carson. Hang on a second. Mr. Carson, just to get your microphone on. Point of order from Finlay Carson. Presiding officer, it's been confirmed in the last few minutes that the Scottish Government has indeed sought an extension for the delivery of farm payments because it will fail to meet next week's deadline. The Chamber will know that Ruth Davidson asked the First Minister twice to confirm whether this was the case earlier today, yet the First Minister refused to answer. Can the presiding officer advise us what exactly is the point of First Minister's questions if the First Minister won't answer simple questions? Thank you. I note the member's comments and uh, they are now a matter of record. The member and other members, including the Leader of the Opposition, will have a chance to uh, raise this matter. There are plenty of opportunities next week to raise this matter in the Chamber, should they so wish. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs>